My name is Derek Douglas. I'm the Vice President for Civic Engagement at the University of Chicago. And on behalf of the university, I want to welcome you to our 125th anniversary event, the next 125 years of civic engagement at the University of Chicago. Um, as I think many of you know, this fall, the university has been celebrating its 125th anniversary by having a series of events that different parts of the university have put on. Um, this event tonight was put on by the Office of Civic Engagement, and we're very proud to have a wonderful panel, all of you here, and the way it's set up, we're gonna hear about some of the work we're doing, but have a lot of time for input and discussion among you all to help inform what we should be working on, the issues we should be trying to tackle in partnership um, with the community. What I wanted to do was to take a little time to talk about our civic engagement framework, um, the work that we've been doing and what's guiding our work in the office and give some examples of some of the work, that, the concrete initiatives that we've been doing um, over the past few years. Um, I wanted to start actually by going back to the beginning. And on the, the screen, you'll see a couple of quotes. The first quote, and you can read it for yourself, I won't read it, but it's from William Rainey Harper, who was the first president in the history of the University of Chicago, 125 years ago. And when you read his quote, what you'll see is that to President Harper and the people at the time who founded this university, the idea of the university being located in the city of Chicago, on the south side, in an urban environment, or surrounded by community, was viewed as something that helped to inform who we are as an institution. It was deeply rooted in our history, this idea of being outwardly engaged, um, and it defined who we were. And a lot of the activities, the, the social service administration, some of the early work coming out of the University of Chicago had that outward facing look. Um, now we all know in this room that the university's relationship with the community over the years has ebbed and flowed. There have been times where the commitment and focus was stronger, there have been times where it was not so strong. Um, but I'm proud to say that today, if you look at the second quote from President Zimmer, today I think that that commitment to partnership, to community and civic engagement is as strong as it's ever been. And what President Zimmer's quote recognizes is that this is ki the kind of work that we have to do in partnership with the community. It's not something that the university can do on its own, and by working with community, there's much more that we can accomplish together. Um, so one of the things that President Zimmer asked, actually when I first took the job, was he wanted us to think about creating a, what he called was an, a new model, or our model of, of civic engagement. Um, one that, that was rooted and grounded in some of the historical work, but was also thinking forward about what we wanted to do. One that was more connected to the everyday work, the fabric, if you will, of the University of Chicago, but also informed and deeply connected to the community as well. And so in doing that, we have identified four guiding principles, and these have really been driving a lot of the activities we've been taking on over the last few years. Um, the first is upholding the university's core values. And by that, I mean universities are unique institutions that do certain things really well. And when we thought about our civic engagement work, we said it's important to try and connect the activities we do through civic engagement to the unique attributes, the unique work of the university. That means tying it to the core mission of the university, which is around education and teaching but it's also tying it to the core functions of the university. The University of Chicago is one of the, the, the main anchors on the south side. We hire people, we build things, we buy stuff, we have a medical center. How can we leverage those activities to have a positive impact in the community, as well as um, our role as an innovator and the technological development that comes out of here? So upholding the university's core values is trying to connect our civic engagement work to those things the university does, and it also means we need to recognize what we're not. The university is not the city of Chicago. There are certain things that the city does that go beyond what we do. 
um, we're not a foundation. And there's certain things we're saying that we can do, but certain boundaries to that. But there's a lot of work, and I'll get to that in a moment, that we can do leveraging our role as an educator, a researcher, an anchor, and an innovator. Um, the second principle is around um, pursuing opportunities of mutual benefit. And the idea there is to think about our work in a way that it both advances the priorities and the interests of the community around us, as well as the priorities of the university. And finding that synergy, that connection between those two um, is what we're trying to, to pursue activities in. I'll talk a moment about, I'll give some examples in a moment of how we're, we're doing that, but I think that this idea of mutual benefit is important because it connects the work that we're doing to the community, but also within the university fabric in a way that people say, well, this is not something on the side that a couple people are doing at the office while the university goes about its business. It, sa it, it, it says that civic engagement's part of our DNA as well, and it's part of what we see advancing our interests. It's part of benefiting the university, not just um, the community, it's both. Leveraging external relationships very quickly, that's really recognizing that the university doesn't have all the answers. That's not always been the, 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 the views, but now I think there's a deep recognition that we have to partner to do this kind of work. There's a tremendous amount of knowledge, a tremendous amount of, of um, opportunity to engage in these deep partnerships to have an impact in our surrounding communities. We have to listen, we have to learn, we have to be um, transparent, we have to be accountable. And so we're trying to build that into the, the, the work that we do. And most initiatives that we take on, there's always a partner that we're doing the work with. We, it's very rare where you'll see the university doing something and we're the only party um, doing it. The last is this idea of having local to global impact. And that's really about thinking about the work that we do here in Chicago and on the south side that could resonate and be scaled up across the country and across the world by other cities and by other universities and looking at it as a model. Also, it's thinking about the university's global footprint and how can we engage civically in those cities where the university has a presence, like in Delhi, um, China, other places. Even though civic engagement is a, a university-wide endeavor, there is a, a unique role that our office plays. And above, you'll see a mission statement um, that we developed that really is guiding um, the work that we do. And what we're really trying to do is to figure out how we can strengthen the impact of the University of Chicago in the lives of people in Chicago, on the South Side in particular, and in cities around the world. Um, that means serving as a resource to people within the university, but it's also serving as a resource to people in the broader community. And a lot of our activities have been oriented towards playing that role. With respect to our work on the south side, um, there's a nine neighborhood footprint that we're particularly focused on, and that's the mid-south side neighborhoods around the university. Um, Will Towns, who you'll hear from later, oversees the team that's particularly focused on this work. Um, you can see the neighborhoods here. Hyde Park is in the center. Um, now, I do need to say that the level act of activity that the university is engaged in varies across these neighborhoods. So it's not to say that we're doing the same amount in all of these communities. Um, but we are trying to make sure that our work touches all nine in some way. And so some of the initiatives go to all nine, some things, like if you take the work on 53rd Street, that's focused more on Hyde Park. And so there's a balancing act, but we're really trying to see how the university can be a catalyst to strengthen these neighborhoods in particular. So I want to turn now to a couple of examples um, under each of those four areas of emphasis for the university, education, research, um, our anchor role, and innovation. So if we start with education, um, the idea here, the goal of our work here, is really about extending education to foster leadership, service, and ideas. And the way we think about that is creating a learning exchange with the community, where we're creating opportunities for people who work at the university, students, faculty, staff, to go out into the community and engage and support and partner with organizations. But we're also creating portals for people in the community to come in to the university and benefit from the educational expertise, resources, and experience that we have. 
Here are a few examples of things that the university's been doing that I think speak to that goal very well. Um, the University of Chicago Charter School Network is a great example. You'll hear more from Shane about that. But it's serving more than 1,700 students in a number of neighborhoods on the Mid-South Side. Our U Chicago Promise and No Barriers Initiative, which is a program focused on kids uh, or students in Chicago hi high schools. And the idea behind the program is to make college more accessible at the University of Chicago, more affordable, but also there's a suite of readiness programs that we do so that when students hit the ground at the University of Chicago or other universities, they're prepared to succeed and thrive in those environments. Um, below you'll see a few um, impact numbers showing the, the impact we've been having, you know, 2.2 million in grants. The second one I think is very powerful. If you look at, since we launched No Barriers, the number of first generation college students um, attending the University of Chicago and the growth there. Also through our neighborhood schools program, which is one of our programs that focuses on readiness, the number of students that are participating and the number of hours that we're devoting to that program. A couple other quick examples, the Community Programs Accelerator, it's really, is our nonprofit incubator, so it's focused on how the university can support nonprofit organizations that are doing, that are located in or doing work that impacts the Mid-South Side, those nine neighborhoods I talked about. Um, the, in the first year, we worked directly with over 11 organizations, and when I say directly, we provided funding, space, or we provided customized technical assistance to advance the work and the capacity of those organizations. Um, and the organizations we work with touch over 23,000 people annually. But we also had some lighter touch programming that we did which reached over 100 organizations across the Mid-South Side. The Civic Leadership Academy is a program that we launched within the last couple of years that's focused on leadership development of nonprofit and public sector leaders. Um, we did one year of the program. It just actually ended this summer. Um, 28 fellows were in the first cohort, four of them. It's really focused on the skills development of these fellows so that they can do better in their current jobs but be ready to take on um, future leadership roles in the city. Four fellows have already advanced into new positions and it talks about the hours as well as the global component where we did a global ex exchange to Johannesburg. On the research side, um, the university's work around urban research I think is is well known, it's, it's long standing. What we, I wanted to do here was just pull out one example that talks about how the research that happens at the university can lead to local and national impact. So if you take the urban labs and the crime lab in particular, they did that um, work with the Becoming a Man program, where, which is a program designed to reduce youth violence um, among African American boys. The, they, instituted a program, they did a randomized control trial, and they showed that, that young men who went through this program, their chances of engaging in violent activity reduced by over 40%. The mayor heard about this program and decided to scale it up across the city and put two and a half million dollars to put it in several schools across the city. When President Obama came to speak at Hyde Park High School, he spent an hour talking to the Becoming a Man students. That inspired him to create a national program, My Brother's Keeper, focused on African American males. So this is research that started here at the University of Chicago. The, re the researcher who did it published their work in the, some of the best journals, um, academic journals out there. But it also was focused on having this broader impact in communities. And it led to this kind of result. And what we're trying to do through the researcher um, program is cultivate and catalyze more of this kind of community-based research at the University of Chicago that's done in partnership with organizations on the ground working in communities. Two more examples and then I'll wrap up. On the anchoring, so the University of Chicago is one of the main anchors on the south side as everyone knows, largest employer, um, largest purchaser and the like. One of the things we try to do is figure out how we can leverage that power of the university to have an impact locally because for a long time we were buying stuff, we were doing this, but it wasn't done in a strategic way to really be directed toward the south side. So we created a program called U Chicago Local that again is focused on the nine neighborhoods I sh listed earlier. And this is a program designed to leverage the procurement 
power of the university and the medical center, as well as the hiring power. Um, so through U Chicago Local, we provide um, technical assistance, capacity building supports to dozens of local businesses. We um, provide workforce development training, as well as try to connect them to jobs at the university and through our vendor network on the hiring side. We do all this work through partnerships. Here's just one kind of um, data point that shows some of the progress we've had in just the first year. Um, there's a lot of more work we're doing though around business development, trying to work with the chambers and others to really catalyze a thriving business environment on the south side of Chicago, as well as a workforce environment on the south side. Another example is our work around arts and culture and what we, um, part of our strategy around being an anchor is thinking about how we can support arts and culture in the various communities. A great example is the work that the Astor Gates has been leading in Washington Park on Garfield Boulevard with the Arts Incubator. Um, I won't give you the statistics, but you can see how in just over a year, year and a half, the impact it's been making in terms of attracting people, programming, and connectivity to the community. We're thinking about how we can build on that success by doing other arts and cultural spaces in Garfield Boulevard. Um, and there have been conversations with the community. I know last summer there were some. We're going to have to have more to think about what that could look like. Another example that I didn't highlight here is our work on 53rd Street. Many of you from Hyde Park have seen what the university has been doing in partnership with the city and the community to help revitalize that corridor. The last um, example I want to use is our focus on trying to spur innovation through local and global enterprise. And the big thing we've done in this regard is to create and launch the Chicago Innovation Exchange. The Chicago Innovation Exchange is a hub. It's located on 53rd Street, and it's focused on supporting and catalyzing innovation and entrepreneurial activity within the university, but also in the broader community. Um, in just over a year, or just about a year, they've attracted 1,300 members. A huge percentage of these are community uh, members. There are a lot of students and faculty, but a huge number are community. Um, they've supported community businesses, helped them raise over a million dollars. They ha created an initiative called the Southside Pitch. I don't know if many of you heard about that, but it's a pitch competition where businesses, community businesses on the South Side can go pitch their ideas and they have venture capitalists and others hearing those ideas and supporting them to try to take their businesses to the next level. So what's great about this is while it's focused on leveraging the research that's happening in the university and the entrepreneurial activity, it's also connecting it to the community and trying to support um, that kind of small and local business development in the neighborhoods. I'm very excited on the direction that we're going and I, you know, none of this would be possible without the partnerships here. The SECC is here in the room, and they've been a tremendous historical partner of the university as it relates to working in the community. And there are many others of you here that have been doing that. And so we really are looking forward to the next, um, I won't be around for another 125 years, but at least the next, you know, 10 years, let's say I'll be here for 10 maybe, hopefully, <laughs> um, that we can work with you all to have an impact in the city of Chicago and on the south side. Now with that, we're gonna hear more concrete examples from our panel, and I wanna turn it over to Will Towns, who's the Assistant Vice President for Neighborhood Initiatives, and has had a, a large hand in helping to shape and develop a lot of the initiatives that I just referenced, and Will will introduce the panelists and kick off that discussion. Thank you. Uh, we're excited today. We have a dynamic uh, group of individuals here that have uh, varying experiences, uh, not only within the community, but working with the university uh, over, over time, and I'm excited uh, to introduce them. Uh, you have the bios were handed out today, so I'm not going to take up the time uh, to introduce uh, uh, the bios and read that, but really want to get into a conversation. So what we want to do today is get into a conversation about some of the work that the individuals are doing here today open it up for some Q&A so we can have some dialogue back and forth. And then at the conclusion of that, we will then proceed uh, to some round table discussions where we can really try to put some pen to paper and find out some ideas and things on how we can improve upon uh, some of the great strides that we've made over the first uh, 125 years. Uh, so today, uh, we have a distinguished group. Uh, we're on a first name basis here today, so we start on that end. It's Shane uh, with the uh, UChicago Charter School, uh, Nina, 
who's here as well, and we'll talk about the work that she's doing in Woodlawn with the Woodlawn Children's Promise Communities. Uh, Dr. Gorman-Smith, and we'll talk about how research uh, leads to uh, practicality and sort of scholarly practitioner work and how we can guide and, and benefit. And then we have Pastor Harris here, who we'll figure out exactly what we're going to talk about. There's a broad group there, but he has a dynamic program uh, that we're going to talk about today. Oh, so let's start with Nina, if you don't mind. Um, given uh, the, the tremendous amount of work that the Woodlawn uh, Children's Promise community is doing around education, uh, can you talk a little bit about how you came up with the concept and how you've uh, found ways to partner with the university on their efforts to increase uh, education within Woodlawn? Sure. Good evening again, everybody. Um, as Will named, I work with Woodlawn Children's Promise community. We are a fairly new organization, so I'll say I appreciated a little historical framework for university engagement. I'm also a new-ish new Chicago transplant, so my lens is really, um, I think, the last five years is what I could speak to around engagement here in the community. So Woodlawn Children's Promise Community um, is a place-based initiative. Our very broad vision is the creation of a quality education pathway um, from birth to college and career and beyond through the new communities program quality of life planning after a series of community dialogues the community here in Woodlawn decided that they were interested in birthing an organization that was rooted in the community but very focused on edu education outcomes for our youth and so that's how we began in 2009 we like to, at this point, look at our work in, in two phases. So we've just ended our startup phase of work at uh, WCPC. And the first five years of our work here in Woodlawn have been characterized by, uh, I think the, the initial piece was sort of the cross-sectional stakeholder buy-in. And that meant um, you know, developing the trust with school leaders, with district, with other you know, nonprofit organizations in order to position ourselves to be able to be a very serious thought partner in the work. And so that was accomplished in our first five years. We had a programmatic arm in our first and phase one of our work as well. That programmatic arm looked specifically at the after school and summer spaces. We thought it critical that our youth be learning um, before, during, and after school. This remains a model for us. It is very important to create positive learning environments for our youth before, during, and after school. We were able to build quality programming that was culturally relevant, so it spoke to our youth. Um, over our first five years, we serviced 375 to 400 youth annually, along with 50 to 75 parents annually. Um, I should also articulate another sort of uh, really important philosophy that grounds our work is this notion of a multi-generational intervention strategy. What we mean by that is that we recognize in order to change outcomes for our youth, we have to also be looking at the adults who are touching our youth. We have to look at the parents. We have to look at the home. And in our community, we've got parents, we've got aunties, we've got uncles, we've got grandmas, granddads. Everybody's raising um, our children. So we don't strictly say parents. We say parents, guardians, and family members. And so for us, any change strategy that was going to meet the needs of our most vulnerable families in community would look at opportunities for and meet needs of both children and parents together. Um, and so we look at the schoolhouse as the vehicle for that. It's really looking at the schoolhouse, which is one of the remaining institutions in our co compromised communities. The schoolhouse is still one of, one of the few remaining institutions. So um, figuring out how we work with school-based leaders to open up schoolhouses and have them become hubs of support for entire families while not distracting from the primary um, uh, outcome that we're invested in, which is positive academic achievement for our youth. I can say um, happily that the university has been a flagship partner from the very beginning. 
I think phase one of the investment was really looking at helping us build our own organizational infrastructure. And so we received um, support, both human capital and um, actual financial investment to shore up the, you know, our organizational capacity. That's been incredibly useful for us. We also got some support on the programmatic side where, and, and I could list uh, several partnerships actually, we have benefited, but I'll just highlight a couple. One, um, you, Derek mentioned the urban research piece. Well, we've definitely benefited from that arm of the university. Um, our early strategies around school improvement were deeply rooted in the consortium's five essential um, work, which identified five conditions that help prepare schools for positive improvement. And so we, that really helped ground our initial thinking around how we could be a partner to our schools. We also had a very close partnership with Chapin Hall. And this is a, a good example because I think like Derek, it shows you how you go from, you know, one, one partnership, but that can influence um, positively many aspects of the work. So in our, maybe our second or third year, we partnered with Chapin Hall to sponsor and um, implement an early childhood needs assessment. So we knew in all of our work that the zero to eight early childhood is critically important for to de determining the trajectory of children's lives. This is sort of common sense. What we didn't know was what our needs were in the community. We worked very closely with Chapin over a series of six to nine months. It's, it's all a, a haze for me now. It was a very big project. Um, they designed the study. We partnered with a uh, course from the uh, undergraduate college and some of our community residents. We trained them on um, implementing this survey. So we had pairs of students and community members, parents and grandmas and aunties and uncles partnered with students and were dispatched out into the community throughout all of Woodlawn to disseminate this survey. And the survey result is what gave us the information that we need to go talking to funders to say, we all know common sense, early childhood is important. We're here now, our community has spoken. They have told us how important it is. Um, because of those results and that early work, we were able to get funding from one of our major um, funders in our early years. That funding literally leveraged full day pre-K in two of our schools. There were no full day pre-K. We knew we needed it in our community because we were able to work with university and the research team and students and parents. This was really a collective win. We were able to garner the funds to literally pay for all of, gave that money to the district. And that is the result of full day pre-K in two of our schools. One of those schools has since lost, lost one of those class, uh, classrooms. Another one maintains it. We need more full day pre-K here in Woodlaw. We'll continue the work. But I think that just highlights um, potential of partnerships um, that are really well-intentioned um, between university and community. Yeah, and I think that's it's very exciting when you talk about the, the community really coming together to solve some of their own issues and concerns and the rise of uh, recognizing the importance of uh, from birth to college uh, uh, is critical. Uh, and the vehicle that, that you're building needs to run on a highway. And when we think about sort of an educational highway, it really is, I think, Shane, uh, one of the models that, that you talk about quite a bit with the Woodlawn Charter School or the, char the university charter school system. Uh, can you tell us how you sort of look at that highway, uh, super highway as you call it, on how we try to get our children and our communities uh, not only through and into college, but out and into careers? Uh what our mission is. I'm gonna be very clear about this. And when I'm at my best on these panels, I think people are both maybe excited, but also maybe a little bit challenged. So I wanna be clear about this. In 2006, there was a Chicago Tribune headline that said six out of 100 students in Chicago would graduate from college by the time they were 25. Six out of 100. If you went to African American males, that number was 2.5%. That's one out of 40. If you included African American males with IEPs, or Individualized Education Plans, it went down to one in 50. Yet, schools operated. People didn't lose their jobs. None of you got that Tribune headline in 2006 and were aghast, because you weren't aghast enough to make sure that something like that changed immediately. You didn't then run outside the room when you got that and started calling everybody you knew. And my challenge this morning, this evening, is actually because I wonder if we believe in the supreme intelligence 
of black and brown and low-income white students in Chicago, but actually the nation. Because if we believed it, we would never accept six out of 100. Because if we go next door to the lab school, and if only six out of 100 freshmen at lab graduated from college, I don't think that would be okay. I grew up on 75th and Exchange, but then we moved to Beverly on 99th and Levitt, right? And I feel very confident in saying that if Mother Macaulay and Brother Rice were getting six out of 100 of their freshmen graduating from college, people would not keep paying the tuition. Don't think that would have worked out at Evanston Township or New Trier. Nine years later, we've made progress in that area. It's now 14 out of 100, which is progress, but it's not enough. And so our goal at UEI, the Urban Education Institute, is to create knowledge, not just for Chicago, but across the nation, that would say that it's actually probable for black, brown, and low-income white students across America to graduate from college. Because they, of course, have the supreme intelligence to do it, it's just that the adults that are in front of them maybe don't have the high enough expectations and the appropriate supports to make sure that they do. And then they're able, when it doesn't happen, to say something's wrong with the parent, something's wrong with the father, something's wrong with the student, something's wrong with the neighborhood. I'm here to tell you there's nothing wrong with the young person. The young people are, in fact, amazing. And so our goal is to create enough knowledge at the University of Chicago to ensure that more of our students across the nation graduate from college. We run a charter school, but I want to be very clear tonight, this is not pro-charter pro school. This is pro-academic belief in young people, right? So we won't get into an argument about charter public versus neighborhood public, because that's a distracting argument. What we're after at the University of Chicago is proving to the best of our ability that our young people can have a counter-narrative on the South Side. We've had six graduating classes at our high school. 98, 96, 100, 100, 100, and 100% 100 of our seniors have been accepted to college. That's a decent number. Don't clap for it because we expect them to go to college. Right? I just said that we should expect them to. So in other words, we were actually just baseline doing our jobs. We get paid to do that. We still have a lot more work to do because our high school graduation rate at our high school isn't 100%. And the percentage of our students who are making big enough gains on the ACT isn't high enough. We've got a lot more work to do. But to be clear, our young people have proven what's possible because they've been accepted to and attended and have graduated from the University of Chicago, Stanford, Harvard, Carleton, Oberlin, Johns Hopkins, Fisk, Lake Forest, Knox, Grinnell, University of Illinois, Missouri, and the list goes on and on. We have a young man, his name is Vernon Fleming. He went to four different elementary schools. He grew up in Woodlawn. He came to our high school in ninth grade. Vernon, during his time in four years at UCW, was a member of our football team, started our debate team, ended up being one of the top debaters in the city of Chicago, started a group called Social Distortion, so that kids who were, had sexual differences or who just, were just different had a place to stay and talk and communicate with. He started a digital after-school program where he took computers apart, put them back together. He earned a posse scholarship. He goes to Oberlin there on a full ride. He spent the last six months in Japan, and he's the vice president of the student body. The thing is, Vernon's right now the exception when he actually should be the expectation. Because he just proved to us what's probable. But at the charter school, we need to do a better job of making sure that 1,900 students are prepared to do that and then at UEI, we need to do a better job, that's the expectation, for the 400,000 Chicago public school students. That's our challenge. We have a lot of work to do there. But I would say kudos to the University of Chicago for launching this endeavor in 1998. It is one of the only research institutions in the nation that has a, a, a approached this problem in a way that is really, to, at least in my eyes, well-rounded. We have the Consortium on Chicago School Research, the Urban Teacher Education Program, which trains teachers, and then we have this program called IMPACT, which takes our tools and markets them in 30 states, 60 cities. And our tools touch 2.5 million students across the nation, trying to challenge them and the adults who teach them to end up in college. Last thing I'll add on, the college is just the means to an end, by the way. What it really is, is to develop black and brown critical thinkers and leaders. So I'll leave you with my Uber example, right? Uber is a $15 billion company. I love Uber. 
It's a pretty slick app. But we actually created Uber on the south side 50 years ago. It's called Jitney. Right? Because people wouldn't pick us up and take us where we needed to go. And so we had to come up with the Uber without the app 50 years ago. But we weren't thinking that we were supposed to create a $15 billion corporation so we would keep the money in the neighborhood and we employ people who look like us. So our mission, if we choose to accept it, is to not only get people into college, but to produce people that look like our young people that then start Uber, right? And then we might have accomplished something. A lot more work to do, but again, kudos to the University of Chicago for starting this endeavor 17 years ago. Thank you. You know, I think what gets me excited about what Shane is talking about is that this work really starts with a dream. There are people thinking about what can be done, thinking about the aspirations of our youth in our community, and knowing that there's brilliance within our community, and it's just a matter of how do we get it to shine. Uh, now I'm going to move over to Pastor Harris, who has a different kind of dream. He has a dream center, a center where dreams can come out and really flourish within our community. Uh, can you take a moment and kind of walk us through what the dream center is, how you came up with that uh, concept, and, and really start to talk about how the university played a role within creating a dream center, particularly the medical center and their involvement and so forth? I went to um, Israel in December of 2012 and saw a place called Natal, N-A-T-A-L. It's a post-trauma counseling center. I went there on the educational trip, and Bright Star Community Outreach is the uh, separate 501c3 uh, from Bright Star Church, where we do uh, intervention, prevention programs. We do after-school programs. We do Safe Passage, and I'm the founder of the Bronzeville uh, Bronzeville Family Festival, where we give away free laptops, school supplies, book bags, and health immunizations, and so many other things. But while I was in Israel, I saw this post-trauma counseling center, and it blew me away. And a light went off in my head to say, I think this is something that we need in our community. Here are the real stats. Then the number was 1,142 people who had been murdered in Chicago since January of 2012. Now... The number is a staggering more than 1,700 people have been murdered in Chicago alone, not including those who have been shot or wounded. And here's the question. Who did the post-trauma counseling for those families? I'll wait. Whether it be the victim's family or the perpetrator's family, the answer is in most cases, nobody. And so I thought to myself, could this be the very reason that we have this vicious cycle of violence. Because hurting people tend to hurt people. How many in this room know that's true? The reality is, in our community, what I said was, there's a way to potentially cause some of this violence to cease. What if we can take faith leaders, identify, train, and certify them to do post-trauma counseling based on this Israeli model? Because what I said was, Black and brown people in our study don't necessarily go to counseling for four reasons. They don't know the counselor, they don't trust the counselor, they don't think they can afford the counselor, and then fourthly, and most tragically, the stigma, nobody wants to be labeled crazy. But I know we won't admit it in this room, but all of us got a little crazy in this. And all of us in this room, let me just do a poll in this room. How many of you have faced a traumatic experience in your life and you wish you had somebody to talk to, raise your hand. Thank you for your honesty. All of us have had that kind of situation, no matter what the trauma is. And so what I said was, I wanted to do it. I came back to Chicago. The mayor visited our church. He asked me what I was working on. And I told him, I said, I'm glad you asked. I told him what I saw in Israel. I said, I wanted to bring that piece of Israel to Bronzeville. He loved the idea. He connected me to uh, Dean Harrison, who is the president and CEO of Northwestern Hospital, he loved the idea. And then I shared with him, I have a partnership that was birthed through the University of Chicago Medicine. And I said, I'd like to reach out to them and bring them to the table. That partnership started through Dr. Dorian Miller. Dorian, raise your hand. He's one of my favorite people in the world. Because before I even had that vision... We came together, and through the Urban Health Initiative, we started 
to do some research on faith leader health. Because if we want to get our communities safe, secure, and healthy, it was the University of Chicago. I was the one who was uh, tapped to bring faith leaders to come to the Urban Health Initiative breakfast. And that we were able to garner 125 of them because most of them uh, call me their, their little brother. And they would come and talk about health. And here's what I said. If the vision is to make the south side of Chicago the healthiest place in the world by 2025, here's the question. How are you going to do it? You can't just make statements and ha not have a strategy. And so we started to do a study through a very, very small grant with Dr. Dorian Miller's uh, leadership and bringing faith leaders in. Because if you want to get to the community, the greatest way to do it is through the congregation. And how do you get to the congregation? It's through the clergy. And so we started to have this conversation. And so that's where the relationship started, through University of Chicago Medicine. And then I connected with Brenda Battle. And Brenda believed in this vision of the Bronzeville Dream Center and said, we have to be at the table to make this happen. And so this started some years ago. And now, years later, we have been able to get to the school side of the university, where we have uh, Dr. Harold Pollack, who helps us with uh, the Chicago Crime Lab being a partner. And now we have Dr. Deborah Gorman-Smith, who is helping us. Because while we have the boots on the ground effect through our community uh, outreach efforts, you need to have those who are focused on academics to be able to help us. And much of this started to happen because of the relationship with Dr. Rudy Nimox, as well as Shaz Razul, with the work we were doing with the Bronzeville Community Action Council. So this Bronzeville Dream Center is literally going to not only provide counseling, but also mentoring, workforce development, as well as parenting. And then the fifth core competency is advocacy. Now, once you do the first thing, which is dealing with the counseling, healing folks, and getting them whole again, you have to deal with the mentoring because what we found out is what our kids lack is point of reference. I'm a great example of that. Yes, I'm from the projects, but what we need is to show them that there are other options out there, that mentorship is important. But we also found out that one of the greatest issues is not with the kids, but it's with the parents. And here's what I always say. You cannot do eight-track parenting in an iPad generation. Let's think about that. Many of our kids have apps on their phones that none of us know anything about. Some people in this room don't know what LOL stands for. They don't know what SMH stands for. So we stretch the parents' understanding and become a bridge by offering programming so that the parents can connect to the kids. And then if you have the workforce development, I don't care what anybody say, you cannot ask the young men and young women to stop sl slinging drugs and gangbanging without giving them options. If you don't give them workforce development skills and if you don't offer them employment and job, they're going to do what they have to do so to survive. I want people to understand. It's not that many of our young people want to sell drugs and be a part of gangs. Some of them, that's the only option they have. But if you give them another option, they'll take it every time. And then why advocacy? Why are we adding advocacy to this Bronzeville Dream Center? It's because I found out through the work that I do is you cannot change a community's situation until you teach the community how to impact legislation. It's very, very important. When I was a kid, we had civic engagement. We don't have that nowadays in schools. So we need to make sure we do what we can to make sure we teach young people another way to change their own communities. And that's how I got connected. People like Brenda and Leif and individuals who are committed to this work that we're doing, saying we want to help you with capacity building. We want to help you to make sure that you have the data that you need. We want to make sure that we build you up and do this knowledge transfer so that you can help your community to live again. And that's why we're excited about the Bronzeville Dream Center, because our people are living a nightmare. The Bronzeville Dream Center and the help that the university is giving to Bright Star Community Outreach will help people who are living a nightmare start to dream again. And that's what we're excited about. Well, that is, that is fantastic. It's really fantastic.
And so I want to hone in a bit with uh, Dr. Gorman-Smith. You talked about the research, and I, and I think this is critically important. For those who are out there who are nonprofit organizations and are looking to do uh, uh, impact in, in, in research within the community, uh, know that the foundations and people who are giving grants are no longer just handing out money and asking you to go out and let us know how it happened. Uh, you passed out 24 bikes, that was a great idea, that's great, we know we help kids. They're really looking for the research and the impact to prove that the methods that you're using are actually having the incomes and outputs that you said that they were going to do. And so Dr. Gorman says, can you talk maybe a little bit about some of your research and how you interact with the Dream Center to help this model be perfected? I think you just heard why I'm so excited to be involved in the research in the Dream Center. and thank all of my um, colleagues that are here in the room who have done so much work to launch the work. Just a little bit of background about me. I'm a clinical psychologist by training. I started doing research on, um, in youth violence about 25 years ago, back when no one was talking about prevention. Prevention was not part of the conversation when we were talking about youth who were involved in criminal offense. It was at the time when we were talking about young people as super predators and putting them away for longer periods of time at younger and younger ages. Um, so our work over the last 20 years has been really focused on trying to understand the nature of the problem, where it's located, what increases youth's risk for being involved in violence, and what serves to protect them from um, being involved in violence when, when, they're, uh, when those risks are put in front of them. When I first started doing this work, much of the conversation was was focused on locating that risk within the individual child. So what do we need to do to fix this child? And our research and the research of others has really moved this to, to really understand um, that much of the risk for youth is located in the communities and the neighborhoods in which they live. Uh, and that we're really going to make a difference. We need to do the kinds of things that we're talking about here tonight. Um, so I spent 20 years looking at risk and protective factors, trying to use that data to develop and test interventions through a, a series, a number of randomized controlled trials. My research is really focused on the intersection between neighborhoods and families and how where you live matters in terms of what it takes to support healthy development in youth. And so we've come a long way. 20 years ago, I would have sat up here and I would have told you that we don't know anything about what prevents youth from becoming in violence. And now we have a growing list of interventions focused on individuals, families, schools, um, that we know have long-term and sustained impact. But we, what we don't know much about is how do we decrease violence within a neighborhood and within a community? And how do we put together this comprehensive and coordinated set of programs um, and evaluate that in a rigorous way so that we can take the knowledge that we've learned and move that to other intervention, uh, uh, other communities. So I'm here as part of this collaboration, building on the, the great work that other people have already done, um, hoping to bring some of our background in science to inform the work that's happening within the Bronzeville Dream Center, but more importantly, working with the community to have the community inform the nature of the research that we're doing and to really do that in a partnership. Um, this is building on work. All of our work has been embedded in the community. We've done similar work in Humble Park and Little Village. Um, and with my move to the south side, I'm continuing to, to move some of our work down to the south side as well. well that, that's dynamic. And I think, you know, when Derek was speaking earlier about how we take sort of our local research and make it global and spread across, um, you know, these issues uh, are traumatic, but they're not just plaguing our, our communities here on the south side of Chicago. You know, the news tries to tell us that's the case, 
uh, but we know that there are many communities like ours across the country and across the world that are struggling with these issues. And we know that from the, the research and the partnerships with the Dream Center and the research that Dr. Gorman Smith is doing, the work that Shane and Nina are doing in their communities, that people are looking for these examples and able to take these across the country and start to improve outcomes uh, across the country and the globe for what we're doing. Uh, I'm gonna take a little moderator privilege here. Uh, we've heard some dynamic uh, conversations and speakers from our panels today. And I think at this point, if we can open it up to get some Q&A uh, and really get some action uh, from the audience and questions you might have, how do you interact with the university? We got some great examples of multiple partnerships that have derived from, uh, I would say, uh, well-established churches uh, and, and large congregations to small uh, nonprofit community groups. Uh, and we'll open it up to really get the dialogue going. There's a unbelievable string of senior dwellings running parallel, almost like railroad tracks, running parallel to the catchment area, as CHA likes to call it, for the university. And I was wondering, is there any concerted, organized outreach to bring that vast reservoir of retirees and elders of the community plugged into the fabulous work under, underway right now that all of you have outlined. So thank you for sharing that. Um, at Bright Star Community Outreach, one of the um, programs we're trying to develop is something called uh, Retired. Now, if you notice the word retired, if you drop the R in the middle, it becomes retired. And we're trying to get seniors and those who are seasoned who say, Pastor Harris, we want to be a part of this process. We're trying to get them reconnected. Um, their experience, uh, their care, their compassion is something that we absolutely need. And we have also found, especially uh, in our programs, we don't want, with our after-school program, for example, we found that there are so many folks who really want to be a part of that, and they have the uh, scholastic uh, wherewithal to be able to help the after-school programs not just be babysitting centers, uh, but bringing some hope to them. Uh, we also found through this whole trauma thing that there are kids who are connected to veterans uh, who are seasoned, who, who we found out that's the best connection ever. And so we're trying to learn from some of those practices. So we hope to be able at Bright Star Community Outreach to use such great resources. Because let me tell you, I really do believe this. Uh, education and parenting, and let me say it like I want to say it, old school parenting is the best violence prevention program ever. Ever. Uh, raising a level of respect back to our community. Uh, the only reason that I escaped that normal prison um, birth cradle to prison pipeline is because of that young lady right there. Not my father, but because of my mother. I was scared of her then, and I'll put the mic down as I say, I'm scared of her night right now. Good evening. Uh, Pastor Harris, could you tell us when, when is the Dream Center expected to open, if it's not already, and how many of... I'll call them trauma victims, will you be able to service once you open? Thank you so much for that question. So Bright Star Community Outreach uh, is already open. We're already uh, serving clients. We've been around for eight years now. Uh, we have about 105 employees that work for us currently through Safe Passage Family Advocacy Center, through uh, different uh, out-of-school programs and things like that. But we did our official launch for the Bronzeville Dream Center effort September 18th of last year, and we hope to uh, do our first uh, training for faith leaders in the first quarter of next year. And so we're really, really excited about that. Uh, the training piece is most important, um, and also developing what we would call a helpline. And so that helpline piece is very important because we don't want to just assume that folks are going to come automatically. Uh, we have to do some work with not only training faith leaders, but also removing the stigma in our communities. And the benefit of having faith leaders, not, it's not limited to faith leaders, but faith and community leaders backed by social workers who will be able to do that knowledge exchange. So we hope to start the training in the first quarter of next year and start to do services uh, in tandem with what our timeline is. And then before this gentleman asks, I just want to ask uh, Dr. Gorman-Smith a question. 
Uh, and that's really, uh, given uh, the heightened awareness of violence and, and, and the need to have violence prevention really as a, a, a thing for the South Side and community, urban centers in general, um, can you talk about how people can find out a little bit more about some of your research or how they could reach out to you if they're interested in conducting studies around uh, violence prevention to get sort of best practices and such? So you can find me on the website. Send me an email. Email is the best way to reach me. I often forget to check my voicemail. Um, I will admit that. Um, so send me a note. We have um, we are funded um, from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We're one of uh, currently six national centers for excellence in youth violence prevention, and one pillar of our mission in this center is to provide technical assistance and support to community agencies, both about moving evidence-based interventions into the community, but hel also helping support um, evaluation effort, e efforts um, to, the, to do the most rigorous evaluation possible, um, because as was said earlier, data helps bring additional funds in, so that's a big part of what we're interested in doing. Um, and also, um, uh, I sit in the School of Social Service Administration, which is the School of Social Work here on campus, which uh, is a workforce training center for, for many of you in the audience. So a big part of my interest is also helping build the workforce capacity at local community agencies to do the kind of work that, uh, that we're all doing. Good evening. My name is Ishmael Toure. I'm from the uh, Hyde Park Kenwood Community Conference School Committee. I have questions and, uh, for all of you, including Mr. Douglas. Uh, charter schools, you're doing a great job. Uh, you're picking up from uh, negative to positive, which is very good. Uh, see, everybody's focus right now is a charter school, including the University of Chicago. But what is left out here it's a CPS schools. But if the university can turn their attention also uh, to the CPS, it will make a big difference in the neighborhood. The first thing I'll say is I appreciate the framing because so often in these panels, it could be either or, right? I'm from the south side of Chicago, and I remember people talking about the south side versus the west side, right? And that's a losing strategy. To me, it's the community as a whole, and so I really appreciate the framing. I want to give two quick examples, and there are more to follow, about how the university is trying to impact not just charter public schools, but all public schools. Here's one, very clear. The Consortium on Chicago School Research in 2006 created a measure called the Ninth Grade on Track Measure, or Freshman on Track. And what the researchers at the consortium found was that what was more predictive of a student's ability to graduate from high school than their race, their socioeconomic status, their mother's highest level of education, and their eighth grade test scores combined was how well they did in ninth grade. And if they passed all of their core classes in ninth grade except for one. So they created the ninth grade on track measure in 2006. In 2006, does anybody know what the ninth grade percentage was? Students being on track, 54%. This measure was then used in 125 high schools across Chicago, all traditional public, all charter public high schools. Last year, the percentage of ninth graders on track in Chicago was 82%. That 28% improvement means that 7,000 more students in Chicago will now be on track to graduate because of the metric created by the University of Chicago Consortium. It's also because adults across the city started, started teaching in a way that our young people, of course, could learn. So the young people deserve a lot of this credit too, of course. I'm just saying that the consortium created the metric. Here's one other example. We created something at our charter school called 6 to 16. We started teaching sixth graders about college. That program got adopted in 40 traditional public schools across Chicago. It's at Fisk, it's at Claremont High School, across where our grandmother lived on 62nd and Claremont Mom. It's at 10 neighborhood high schools in the city. That was funded by the Lefkowski Foundation and CPS. 
So in those 10 Chicago public schools, they are now using a program that starts teaching sixth graders about college and gets them to try to improve their grades and attendance in seventh grade so that they can get into more selective high schools, ultimately more selective colleges. To be clear, we haven't done enough yet. There's a lot more that UEI and UChicago Charter need to do to impact it, but I do wanna say the meta thing that we're trying to do is create the fact that black people are supremely intelligent. And so we are trying to create a mission where there's a counter narrative on the south side of Chicago, that people would expect young people from traditional public and charter public schools to of course graduate from college, which I hope will be the most powerful thing that we actually do. Thank you. I also just want to respond to that question, which I appreciate, um, and say that uh, as an organization, our focus is the neighborhood schools. In fact, it was um, an imperative handed down from Bishop Brazier to say that we had to continue to leverage to invest in neighborhood schools. His vision said, and this isn't an anti-charter statement, but it is to say, how do you cherry pick the student who deserves a quality education of all of the children in Woodlawn. So the broad vision is looking at neighborhood schools in partnership with anybody and everybody, which includes the charter network here in Woodlawn. We have a very close working relationship and continue to try and leverage our resources across these kids because all of these kids are our kids. They're all our families. We're in Woodlawn. So the, the, the charter versus neighborhood school distinction in terms of the outcomes that we're trying to achieve really is that's, that's socially constructed. It's not real. These are our families. These are black and brown kids. And so um, that remains our mission. We look forward to continuing to work with the university for a specific investment in the Woodlawn quality pathway with a specific focus on the IB pathway. So we're really interested in bringing the International Baccalaureate program here to Woodlawn. We've got two designations. One is a diplomacy program in the high school. It has the IB designation. We also have a middle years program at Fisk, has the designation recognized by the district, but no resources to, to do the type of school change necessary so that we have an IB program that mirrors some of these strong institutions on the north side. So that is our objective. The University of Chicago has already named shared interest in that objective, and we are sitting at the table literally now to talk about what we can do collectively to invest in this pathway, um, and, we, and, and it needs to happen now. Thank you for that. We'll now move into the closing uh, statements. If anyone wants to make a, a brief statement, 30 seconds or less, please. One of the themes that really resonates with me from tonight is the notion of reciprocity. So understanding that all of these collaborations and partnerships have to be rooted um, in an understanding that we, are, we share accountability here. So I've been really encouraged to hear this message throughout remarks about the university um, engagement moving forward. Even, not even moving forward, because the quote from your first president really impressed me. I said, oh, he understood, right? This isn't just about the betterment of, this, of the greater community of Woodlawn. It's about all of us bettering one another. It's about that, that level of respect and understanding that our identities are intertwined. And so I'm really appreciative of that theme tonight, and I hope that we all continue to move forward um, collaborating in that spirit. I'm gonna be ringing both of you. Let me just let you know that now, because we have opportunities for working moving forward. So Great. thank um, you. Thanks. Shane? In Other People's Children, Lisa Delpit on page 171 says, we all say that we believe that the children that we teach can learn at high levels, but we really don't believe it because of everything that we've seen in our day-to-day -day experiences. And so my 30 seconds is going to challenge you, us as a collective, to celebrate, expect, demand black acad academic excellence. Thank you. Dr. Gorman Smith. Um, I'll end by saying I think we can do that because we have data that, a growing data that shows that that in fact is the case. 
Um, I think everyone here in the room, we're here because we care about making a difference in the lives of children and families and communities that we work. Um, so I will make a pitch that I think a big part of our ability to do that is through the use of science to help inform, through the use of data um, to inform our practices and move um, the field forward. I, I, I think a lot has happened in the last 20 to 30 years in the area that I work in, and um, we have not solved the problem, um, but uh, I think continued collaborations like this will get us much closer to doing that. Pastor Harris. Thank you. So let me just again say thank you for allowing me to be here tonight. Um, I'm, I was glad to hear that the guiding principles, uh, one of those guiding principles is pursuing opportunities for mutual benefit. and also upholding the university's core value. Uh, the, John Maxwell said it best, the very definition of vision is foresight with insight based on hindsight. And I wanna challenge both the University of Chicago Medicine and school. Uh, true community partnership and relationship will only happen when all parties, all stakeholders connect because they want to, not because they feel they have to. That's what will bring relationship sustainability between this institution and the community. Notice earlier, everybody gave the shout out, but you can only give shout outs when the folks who represent this institution come out. Our people will not believe that this institution care about the community until they see this institution in the community. I'm grateful to people like Shirley Newsom, who convinced me and made me believe that this institution really does want to not only listen, but do more than listen, actually pay attention to what the community is saying and empower the community. Because at the end of the day, we have a responsibility to make sure this university is a resource to the people right within its reach. Thanks so much. Please join me in thanking the panel.